Rich for reminding us that those who call upon the name of Jesus, that we are redeemed. Folks, tonight I want to start out with something just a little bit different. I want to, um, I want to read to you all some real, actual inscriptions on gravestones. Um, I found this one near Uniontown, Pennsylvania. It says, here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. Uh, the other one is in Pennsylvania. It says, in loving memory of Ellen Chin, age 25, who was accidentally burned March 21st, 1870, by the explosion of a lamp filled with R.E. Danvers non-explosive burning fluid. <coughs> Here are some other random tombstone sayings. Here's the first one. My new health care deductible was too high. These are actually written on tombstones, folks. Follow my blog at underthegroundchat.com. Here is one I found in Lincoln County, New Mexico. Here lies Johnny Yeast, pardon me for not rising. And last, uh, here's one in Albany, New York. It says Harry Smith, born 1903, died 1942. Looked up the elevator shaft to see if the car was on the way down. It was. Uh, I read those just for some fact that, you know, they might have been interesting to see, might have been a little bit comical to see. Um, but what we're going to look in tonight, Ezekiel, uh, a lot of you all are familiar with this passage. It would have been a completely different scene. It would have not been comical. It would have been, matter of fact, it would have probably been very, um, very dramatic, um, just looking at the Valley of Dry Bones. And I don't know, do we have, nope, okay. So I was going to play a video for you guys, like, uh, just to, to kind of set the tone and so forth. But if you will, go ahead and turn to Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And while you guys are turning there, let me kind of go ahead and set this up for us. Uh, this is a letter that was circulated through the empire of Babylon. And the... Jews have been exiled. They have been taken captive into uh, Babylon. And so this is a letter for comfort. The theme of Ezekiel is about the glory of God, the Shekinah glory and the reverence of God. But specifically tonight, we're going to be looking at Ezekiel chapter 37. And 37 deals with the restoration of Israel. Not only does it deal with the restoration of the entity of the nation of Israel... But it also will be looking at the revival, the spiritual revival of Israel itself. Now, this is a vision that God has given to Ezekiel, but he also interprets it to Ezekiel about the seriousness of the situation that is at hand. So, if you will, Ezekiel 37, I'm going to kind of first read for the first 14 verses before we kind of go and break this down. It says, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent me down the midst of the valley and was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied. As I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling on and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds of breath and breathe on these slain, they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, they lived, and stood upon their feet in exceedingly great army. And he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. 
Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray, please. Father God, tonight we come into your very presence. We are expecting, Lord, to hear from your very word. Tonight, Father, I specifically am praying for everyone here and for everyone here's family as represented, that, Father, that you would resuscitate us, that you would revive us, Lord, that you would speak to us through your very word, that the Spirit of God fall upon us. And let us be challenged and take heed to your very word as we leave tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we're looking into Ezekiel 37, chapter, chapter 37, verses 1, tonight uh, I've titled this, Necessitate Me. And um, we're going to be looking at four specific key truths of when God resuscitates his people. So we're going to start looking in verses 1 through 3. And again, it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And he stopped there. So Ezekiel was caught up in a vision by the Spirit of God. And he takes him to this valley of dry bones. And God asks him, Does, can these bones live? And so if you look at very first verse 1, hand of the Lord, it just means that Ezekiel is commissioned by God's power and strength to communicate God's truth. But when you read the passage about the valley, you've got to know a little bit of the context of Hebrew culture. Because Hebrew culture, just like anybody else, they were very respectful when it came to um, bones and to uh, proper burial. So when Ezekiel comes to this, and it's human remains, it's carcasses, it's bones, there's three things that we can tell. Number one, um, in verse 11, since we found out this was an army, that these dry bones were of. If an other army slain you, killed you, and left your the other army on the battlefield, it was as a supposed, it was a mockery. Number two, it was a divine judgment by God. And then number three, if bones or human remains were left on the land and they were not properly buried, it was defiled against the land. Because here's the thing, in Hebrew culture, you would wash the body, you would wrap the body, and then would it be given a proper burial. Either it would be in the ground, but most likely in a tomb. And so they had a high regard, a high respect for bones. And so these bones were out there for so long that you could only imagine the vultures and animals would have eaten the flesh. But we know in verses 1 and 2 that it talks about that these, these bones were very dry. They were so dry, when you look at very dry, it means the sun bleached the bones. Okay? So we come back and we say, all right, son of man, anytime you see an expression or a word in the word of God mentioned more than twice, please pay very careful attention to it. Because son of man is mentioned 93 times in the book of Ezekiel. And it's a poetic, it's a Hebrew poetic expression of being human being, but it goes beyond that. It is convey, it's conveying that God is communicating only through Ezekiel of his power, of his magnitude, of speaking of his truth, of prophesizing to these bones. So what does that mean for us? When we look at these first three verses, what does this mean to us? When God resuscitates, he can make the impossible possible. When God resuscitates, he can make the impossible possible. Let me share something with you. If you haven't read it in the news or on Facebook or newspaper, it's been on national TV, but there is a revival going on in southern West Virginia. 
And for several years, there's people that I know personally have been praying for this revival, not only in our state, but specifically for Southern West Virginia because of drug epidemic. On March 24th, there's a, there a high school student by the name of Skyler Miller who went to, or still goes to, Logan County High School. And there he is. Can you go back to the other picture? Uh, right here, just I know you guys probably can't see that really well, but Scholar Middle or Scholar Miller is the guy who is standing up. He is a victor over two leukemias, and during his leukemia, he is a follower of Christ, and he has just been leaning upon Jesus and, and asking Jesus, "Okay, what do you want me to do with my life? I want to be bold in my faith." On March twenty fourth. He had a conversation with Mr. Gosby, his teacher, and this teacher also leads a prayer club group at Logan County High School. And after the prayer, the Mr. Gosby, the teacher, was praying that he would have boldness to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ the gospel in the hallways in Logan County High School. Something that we know as of today is kind of a very impossible situation. As soon as we get done with that prayer, uh, Skyler is quoted in an article that he literally felt that God was saying, today is the day. And so in this picture right here that was taken, he literally starts walking up and down the hallway and starts giving not only his testimony, but he also starts preaching the gospel. Nine students gave their life to the Lord that day and several others. That was just the beginning of the day when he started doing this. There was, that whole entire hallway was flooded with students. But... Here is, a, here is a boy who was probably thinking this is impossible. But what's also amazing is still to this day, the revival is still continuing on. There has been more than 500 students in the southern part of West Virginia have been giving their lives. We have two different conferences, Awake in the Mountains and Jesus is Better Movement that is taking place in southern West Virginia right now. Now granted, it's been a lot of prayers and so forth, but the prayer... He is the one that kind of started this, in an essence, if you want to call it, this movement with prayer back behind him. So that God that can take the impossible possible. So tonight, my question to you all is this. What is your impossible situation that God is asking you to trust him in? If you search the very crevices of your heart, is there, quote, quote, an impossible situation where you're like, you know, you, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm thinking of. This is just what I'm looking at is impossible. What is that impossible situation that God is wanting you to trust him in? And I, and I ask you that for this reason. Because based upon your response, but based upon the outcome. And I say that because... Either are you willing or are you hesitant? Because let's, look, let's continue to look in verses 3. Ezekiel, God said, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So right then, right there, God is asking Ezekiel, we're looking at a valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel's probably thinking, okay, this, this is impossible. But because you're God, because you're Jehovah, the creator of the universe. Anything is possible with you. And because, because of this, verse 3 says, So I answered, O Lord God, you know. And so because of his response to trust in God of something that was impossible made possible, we look further on, verses 4 through 10, that God gives him further instruction. He gives him further instruction. So verses 4 through 10 Ezekiel prophesies to these bones, and he witnesses them come alive. So I want us to look through verses 4 through 7. It says, again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause a breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. 
So, first and foremost, prophecy, prophecy is this. Prophecy is speaking truth into a matter of encouragement, but it also can be to speak about covenant faithfulness. Okay? Because here, the Jews, they've been unfaithful, they've broken the covenant, they've been vile, they've been wicked, and so God's judgment has come upon them, and they were exiled to Babylon. And so, we look at verses 4 through 10, and I'll carry on here in just a bit, but I want to give you guys this. When God resuscitates, unordinary moments can turn into an extraordinary experience when we're obedient to Him. Let me repeat that. Unordinary moments can turn into an extraordinary experience. And I say that several years ago. Uh, our youngest son, Elisha, I don't know, he might have been maybe like a year, year and a half old or something. Um, but several years ago, I was doing a prayer walk over on this side of the west side, all the way down here. I forget the name of the street, but it's where the house burned down. And there was like six kids in it that, you know, caught up in the fire and so forth. This is several years ago. And as I'm walking down the street, I'm praying over each house. I see individuals, I'm praying over there. And I come to the end of my prayer walk and I see this house. And I see this woman kind of gathering her stuff out of the car and she goes in the house. And for some odd reason, God just has me to keep praying over this house and over this woman. And for the next couple of days, I can't stop thinking about, for some reason, this, this woman in this house. And so a couple of days later, I'm mowing grass and grass takes me about, you know, three and a half hours or so. But I'm literally arguing with God because I feel that God is telling me to get a gift card from Kroger's to go to this lady's house and give it to her. I ain't never done this. And so as I'm mowing the grass, I'm like, God, this is, this is crazy. This is, this is unheard of. Like, who does this? And so the more I kept on arguing, the, the, the stronger the conviction kept on. And so I came in the house and said, babe, this is crazy, but um, let's just pack up Elisha. Let's go to Kroger's. We're going to get a gift card. And we're going to go knock on some door. We have no idea. We're going to give him a gift card. But I have no idea what I'm going to say. So we drive. And so my wife looks at me and she goes, well, you, do, you, do you know what you're going to do? You know what? No, I have no idea. So we pull up to the house, knock on the door, you know, once or twice. And he comes out and I basically said, look, ma'am, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm, you know, I just, I'm here to give you something. And as soon as I gave that to her, she started crying. And then her next response is that she looked at my wife and I, she said, can I hug you? And so she started hugging Sarah and I, and then she was like, she started explaining her situation. And I just told her that, hey, you know, a couple weeks ago, about a week ago, I was doing a prayer walk and God just led me to this and that. Her situation was that she just got custody of three of her grandkids. She barely had any food because of her kids are, were drug addicts. And so she took her grandkids. And so she has been praying. She actually knew some of the people that went here. She goes to a church in Kanawha City. But it was just, it was fascinating of how God intertwined that. Because it resuscitated my soul, it resuscitated my wife's soul as we're driving the way home. That I come back and I say, okay, Lord, unordinary moments can turn into extraordinary experiences when we're obedient to God. So, looking in, starting in verses 7, all the way through verses 10, we're looking at the stages of restoration. And in verses 7, when you look at this, this is talking about the scattering of the bones of Israel. They were scattered all throughout the world. And they were dead to the things of God and God. And so, you know, as I was preparing this, maybe that might be some of you all tonight. Maybe that might be someone who's watching this or listening to this. Maybe you felt scattered. Scattered in the sense that maybe you felt scattered in your relationship with Christ. Meaning that maybe you've been dis obedience and you haven't been listening to the voice of God of what he has asked or called you to do. Maybe there's some of us in the room that we need to be resuscitated just for the simple fact that first of all, we need to repent of the sins that we have committed before a holy God. And we haven't done that yet. Maybe for some of us, we just need to come before God and say, okay, Lord, I'm dry. I'm stagnant in my relationship." In verses 8, 
It says, indeed, as I looked, indeed, as I looked, the sinews and flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, and over, but there was no breath in them. Since 1948, Israel has become a nation. They've got anything and everything, but they've kind of lacked of being on fire for the Lord. And so, it's kind of like one body, it's the bones coming together, but there's no life. And as I read this, and I was, I was meditating on this passage, I was thinking about us, I was thinking as America, I was thinking as a whole, as the body of Christ. Maybe there's a lot of us that do stuff, quote, quote, for God, but we don't have a heart for God. And I say this, that maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're out in the community and you're with an organization. Maybe you serve in an organization. Maybe you serve here. Maybe you serve somewhere else. Maybe you come here all the times that this church is open, all the times that these doors are open. And you serve and you do your checklist. And I did Sunday, I did Wednesday, I served everywhere else. But for a lot of us, it's stuff. Are we doing it for the motive? Are we doing it for the right reason? Do we have a heart for God? Because a lot of times 